So the, a brief history of blockchain. You know, it first started um, with uh, in World War II. You had a guy named Alan Turing, and he's the guy who invented cryptography, and that was used to um, to in warfare. And it was that was sort of the, the start of things. After um, World War II, you had Bretton Woods, which was when they uh, attached money to gold. So gold became like this this intrinsic value that money was attached to. And then in '72, um, Richard Nixon um, stopped that, and it, and it became start to float against um, productivity, which is a, which is a different measure. Um, and this had an impact on the way people saved and people spent. Um, and then something funny happened in 1967 through 1985. There were these things called intentional communities. I'm not sure if you remember them. That's like a fancy name for communes. But they were showing up in a lot of universities. You have kids and people living in these intentional communities. They were they were self-governing. They had these rules and they had internal currencies and, and stuff like that. And that, that sort of looks a lot like the DAO. Um, the way the DAO is, even if you look at some of the ways that, that these things are built, it just reminds you of these intentional communities back from the 60s and 70s. Um, I actually lived in one for a while, and it was a very formative experience. Um, and then you had in 1969, 75, the Apollo program. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, about that, what Apollo brought us. It brought us, you know, incredible innovation. You know, getting to the moon was an incredible, incredible feat. It brought us the, the computer. It brought us the integrated circuit. It also taught us how um, computers could vote. So uh, Apollo and the space shuttle, you had situations where you had computers voting. So you would have three computers, each voting separately. And if it was not unanimous, then you knew you had a problem. Okay, so that is kind of one of the big chunks of blockchain that came out of uh, that that program. And then in 92 to 2008, you had like the cypherpunk movement. These, this was a group of people, I guess they're the emerging, emerging libertarian groups that were, they were saying the only way to be free is to be anonymous. And they did a lot of work with cryptography and, and they started building communities around these, these cryptographic uh, ideas. Um, a lot of them now take credit for, for, um, for blockchain, I would say um, not so much, but they were a big, big part of it. Um, in 93 through 97, you had something called the Big Bang of Globalization. This was things like uh, NAFTA, where you are trading um, goods as well as services. So, you know, it's easy to trade uh, tomatoes and stuff, but now how about financial services and engineering services and, 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 um, and, and information services? That was new. And then that happened at the same time as the Internet. So now you could, you could transfer these services over this technology called the Internet. And then the internet was a one-way device, and then you had the dot-coms, which was one, one dimension plus uh, a storefront. And then you had social media, which was where um, you had two dimensions or three dimensions where, where people would actually provide the content, and they could talk to each other. And then you had, um, uh, and during that interesting period of time between 2002 and blockchain, you saw a, a reemergence of the intentional communities. You saw a lot more of uh, activity surrounding the, um, the, the inventions of, of community currencies like you had um, Ithaca dollars and you had the Bay Bucks and, and, and co-ops were getting big again. Then all of a sudden that stopped with blockchain. Somehow those intentional things, uh, they kind of disappeared and blockchain became the big thing. The other thing that happened which is interesting was these internet platforms like Google, Airbnb, and Alibaba, and so forth. And we'll talk about those a little bit more. Um, so I think everybody's seen some rendition of this chart, right? Uh, $100 worth of Bitcoin in 2010 is worth about $7 million now. Um, the Bitcoin market cap is $125 billion. Total uh, cryptocurrency market is about $250 billion. But, you know, this is supposed to be a decentralization movement. And a thousand people control about forty percent of Bitcoin. Does that sound very decentralized to you? You know, so these are questions we're asking ourselves now. Um, there's VC are, are investing in fintech at around six six point sixteen point six billion dollars in twenty seven. Insuretech uh, is is invested um, what two point three billion dollars. And then there's Engtech is with the domain I'm in, and there's very very little investment in engineering technology in blockchain which is a staggering omission. So it's something we need to, to, to consider. I'm going to pop back to this slide really quick and just summarize it by saying that 
Um, it's a social movement more than a technological movement. A lot of people look at blockchain and say it wasn't here yesterday, it's here today, new technology, shiny object, this is cool. But no, this is a huge social movement. It's more social than it is technical. And the problem that we should try to avoid is getting confused and thinking that um, it's a technical uh, thing, it's, it's a social movement. Um, so we have a definition of blockchain as this decentralized, distributed public ledger um, that's used to record transactions across many computers so that um, a record cannot be altered retroactively without alteration of uh, all subsequent blocks and the collusion of the network. So that's the big complex definition you'll see on Wikipedia or any place else. Um, my definition of blockchain is a lot simpler. It's, it's this clumsy little dance that a computer needs to do in order to simulate something that humans have been doing for thousands of years. So um, you'll, you'll notice that blockchain uses words like blocks and chains and forks. And, and these, are, these are words that we use in, in, our, in our social interactions. And um, I, I put this little picture of the robot right there because you, know, you look at the robot and you're, and you're able to anthropomorphize you know, humanity in this machine and you start saying, wow, this is great. It can bring me my lunch upstairs. But really, you know, the best way to solve this problem is with an elevator. It's not to create a robot that looks like a human so that it can remind you that you're not. Um, so, so it's sort of a, you know, the idea here is that, that um, this, this, this device is supposed to be the slave, not the master. And it's, if you can't understand it from a social element, then you, um, it's probably not right. Okay, so there's a lot of, like you said earlier, there's a lot of um, hype and there's a lot of bad actors and they try to confuse you with their technical um, uh, expertise and with these words and these confusions. Um, but if you don't understand it intuitively, then it's probably not a very good idea. So this is something I want everybody to trust their intuition when they approach blockchain and people talking about blockchain. So first thing we have to ask is what problem does blockchain solve? Um, it solves the handshake problem. Um, so this is a picture that's thousands of years old. And, and, the, and the, uh, the example that I usually use to demonstrate is I'll, I'll get into the audience and I'll hold somebody's hand and I'll pretend that we're like in a marketplace in the 1500s and I've got a chicken, the other person has, you know, maybe some corn. Now, you know, we don't know each other, so we hold hands because I don't want you to run away with my chicken. So I put the chicken on the table, you put the corn on the table while we're holding hands. And I inspect the corn, you inspect the chicken, and we both agree that it's a good trade, and then we let go hands. That's what a blockchain does. It's, it's, um, it's like an escrow device, and it's like it avoids... Um, cheating because both of you are in consensus that you reach consensus before you open the blocks. <coughs> I've got a, um, a full lecture on this, but I won't take you into it because it gets a little, a little, bit, a little bit technical. But what does it solve the handshake problem? Right now, the computers are really good at at copying stuff. So if I send you a contract, um, you've got the same uh, contract I do, so I can change the conditions of the contract, and nobody knows which is the valid one. Um, because computers are good at copying things. It's really, really difficult to get a computer to not copy things. And this is what this entire dance of blockchain is all about, getting a situation where the computer can't copy something. It's fooling the computer. It, has not, it shouldn't be fooling the people. It's fooling the computer. So um, that's, that's what we're, we're up against, is trying to get to a place where I can send you something over a computer and you have the only valid copy of it and I no longer have that valid copy of it. That little tiny thing is just enormous. It's a massive idea, and it opens up a lot of different possibilities. But we're going to, um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the money side and, and what money is and how money came to be. Um, here is, here's a picture of world GDP um, since year zero, okay? And you know, the world didn't exist. Okay, so, so the, I guess the global economy is, is $80 trillion or something like that. I mean, the world did not begin with $80 trillion sitting in some box in the desert someplace waiting for us to find it. The world began with nothing, and we measured that value into existence 
through the things that we made. Okay, so we measured the money into existence. You know, just wrap your head around that. We can do that. We can measure money into existence. So what I did was I showed these um, these points, point A, which is those guys um, shaking hands. I'm going to talk about point B, C, D, and E, and show you what happened to GDP along the lines. The first event, B, was um, the, the invention of the heliocentric universe by uh, Copernicus. Okay, so before then, we all thought, if you were to just take the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and you isolate them in space, and you erase everything else, you don't have enough information to tell whether the Sun is going around the Earth, or the Earth is going around the Sun. The only way you can really see that is if you compare them to a stationary object. And he said it was the stars. So Copernicus said, wait, the stars are are still, and this is moving against the background of the stars, now I can discern what's happening. But he had to make that assumption, and he needed to have what's called a time function. So he had to measure things with respect to time. If you think of the world as static, you can't tell who's going around whom. But Copernicus introduced this thing called time, this function of time, and that led to things like um, it just changes, it just changed everything. My goodness, it created calculus, the scientific method. You're able to now explain the weather. You can now navigate, explain the tides. You can invent this idea called mass and gravity. And it led to the same mathematics that's used in finance and insurance. Just that little observation of adding a time function created this enormous amount of new ideas, new to the world thoughts and ideas. Now, the blockchain does that. It creates a time function because the blockchain is sort of clicking away like a metronome. It's like a big time machine. And you can just put your events on the blockchain and then you can analyze them computationally at a later date. So if you, if you understand, if you look, if you can imagine the differences since this one little idea came about, um, you can imagine what the future holds for us. Um, both good and bad, um, because, well, you look at Eli Whitney, okay, Eli Whitney, he did something else that was very interesting. He, he changed the paradigm, he had another one of those, those really interesting ideas where instead of building each um, item as one unit, he said, well, if we can reduce the risk or the variance in the size of these parts so that this piece is always just a little bit smaller than the smallest bit of that piece, then they'll fit together independently. So now you could take all the parts of a gun or something and you could just mix them all up and you can he took 10 rifles, he, he took them all apart, mixed all parts together and then he reassembled 10 working rifles. It was a very, very simple idea. But what he did was he took the risk, uh, so he took the systemic risk out of the construction of that um, unit. So you can kind of see how that changed everything. It turned into the Industrial Revolution. It allowed us to do um, you know, assembly lines, build cars, build um, houses, build everything, medical equipment, all kinds of stuff. Even, um, and then this guy named Jules Verne says, why don't we, we can, we can shoot ourselves into the moon with one of these things. So then the idea came that we can go to the moon and, and then we, we developed the Apollo program and that led to these amazing developments in the integrated circuit. We invented everything that we have today could be attributed to these three events. But when we got to the moon, we found that it was a pretty dusty place and there was really much there. Um, but the process of getting there is what created all this value. So this is this is the other point. If we go up to this chart here, I meant, forgot to mention, um, point B was Copernicus, point C was Eli Whitney, uh, point D was Apollo, and now point E is today. So you see how all this value, this is the money that was measured into existence through the process of going to the moon, for example. Um, so... We, today we see there's two primary use cases for blockchain. One is like this mechanization of transactions. That's sort of the idea that that you can um, you know replace all the people working in the back office. You know you don't need all those pesky agents anymore. They want you know free you know free holidays, free vacation, and they you know they want insurance and stuff. So you can get rid of those guys and those girls now, and you can you can put this machine that'll do all that stuff. Um, 
uh, one way. Then you have another set of uh, ideas. So they're organizing things with respect to time. And those are the new to the world inventions that are going to come out of blockchain. And then there's the old world inventions, which is you know just changing uh, the legacy institutions to make them more efficient. I find that really, really boring. I find that not very interesting and possibly dangerous. But the other part, new to the world activities, oh, that really, really gets me going. That's what I think the future of blockchain needs to be. Um, if you look at you know Eli Whitney again, you'll remember he did the cotton gin, and he created the cotton gin, which made um, made growing cotton much more profitable. So as growing cotton became much more profitable, then that increased the slave trade to a point where it was no, it was it was it was, it was vile. It was getting very bad, and then the North and the South started having political problems with with uh, the slave trade because the cotton gin had increased the profitability of that industry. So what Eli Whitney did was then he, he got out of the cotton business and he made guns. So that allowed everybody to fight. So, I mean, is this, you know, these are sort of the things, even though so much came out of those inventions, getting to the benefit was really not a lot of fun. It was, it was uh, you know, the rocket that went to Apollo, went to um, the moon, came out of, you know, Nazi Germany. So, so do we really, you know, or what are we setting ourselves up for if we take only that approach where we're mechanizing ourselves now with this electronic device? So we absolutely have to have the other piece, which is organizing society with respect to time. So these are the two primary use cases of blockchain right now. There's a whole bunch of people going one direction, and then there's a whole bunch of people going down the other direction. And that's kind of... Um, you'll see the mix and stuff, but that's kind of what I see as being the two um, the two avenues. And um, you're not going to get you're not going to make one stop and, and and not have the other. You have to have them both. And it's going to take communities like yours and ours and the Government Blockchain Association and the Construction Blockchain Association. All the consortia, all the people need to be really working together and and um, to to invent these other um, new to the world. Uh, organization reorganize ourselves as a society and that's that's going to be our best defense against the you know you know the dark side of this mechanization principle i mean nobody's going to say that you have to bring back the typing pool ever after the after the word processor was invented but you notice that everybody went from typing to word processing so you ever all the people went to a higher state of productivity they weren't stuck in a lower state of productivity and that's what you want to avoid um with, with some of the mechanization ideas. So anyway, I'm going to get off that slide. Um, I want to talk about platforms right now. Um, you know, you've heard of Uber, obviously, and, and, and Airbnb and, and Facebook, and the slogan, of course, is Uber is the biggest transportation company, and they don't own any cars. Airbnb is the biggest hotel. They have no room, property. Um, Facebook has no newspapers, you know, and so forth. So there's that, there's that, that saying there. What these, what these devices are, they're platforms, okay? So their value comes from uniting people, so mix, matching people. So the people are, in fact, both the product and the, 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 uh, the customer. And the way they operate is as a platform. So, so, um, so what you're not, you're not, you're, it'll cost like $100 million to replace all of um, you know, Google's code, for example, if you have to rewrite their code. But the value of the company is a great deal more because what you're taking into account is the network effect. That's the number of people using this application, which is squared by two. It's called the network effect, uh, which is squared. And each individual um, brings value, and that value is squared by the number of individuals, and that's the new valuation for these networks. If you look at the old way of looking at business, you would have just a simple um, you know, ROI statement, meaning 5-6% profits and, and that's the way they grow the old way but in the new way it's exponential when you have a platform which unites people that brings them together it's like a bridge a bridge allows two communities to come together and to to have you know soccer uh, games and to and to make community and, and to make theater and to have commerce and those are all the things that are being factored into the value of Airbnb and Uber and these things so there's a new way of measuring value 
Okay, so we see the old way of measuring value, and you saw the chart go up, but now there's this interesting new way of measuring value. So if, um, if these Uber and Airbnb, if they're acting like a bridge, why not use a real bridge as a platform? So when you're looking at things like infrastructure, roads, bridges, highways, um, fresh water in Flint, Michigan, schools, airports, all the things that society utterly depends on, um, if you look at them in the old way of valuation, you have maybe so the replacement cost of that bridge, okay? Uh, but if you look at it in the new way of valuation, that bridge is connecting two large bodies of people. And the value that those people create, that they produce by interacting with each other and being together and united in society and, and community, that far exceeds the value of the bridge itself. So if we're in an economy which is just measuring the bridge um, and we're running out of money, maybe we need a better way to measure the productivity. And this is, these are some of the ideas that, that are coming out of blockchain. Um, so infrastructure is a platform upon which everybody utterly depends. Your energy, your, your food, your clean water. So why not turn, why not store value in infrastructure and then what you do is you count it like you would a Google. You don't count it like you would a utility. Like, and that's something that can be done with blockchain that couldn't be done after blockchain, uh, before blockchain. Um, there was a guy named Robert Solo. He was, a, he was a professor emeritus at MIT and he studied the contribution of technological change on economic growth. And he said that 80% of economic growth was due to innovation. And what that turns out to be is society, community, social capital, creative capital, and intellectual capital. Those are the things that are creating the economy. But we have this model of classical economics which is, which is built on land, labor, and capital. And land, labor, and capital um, the reason why we use land, labor, and capital as a measure of our economy is because it's really easy to measure. And back when Adam Smith was talking about these things and, and David Ricardo, his student, were talking about these things, that's the, the only, you had to have some method of, of, of you know, talking about productivity in a way that was really easy to measure. It was really easy to measure land and really easy to measure labor and really easy to measure capital. So that became the basis of our economy. Um, so we, here's this graph again. We see well, if we can measure um, this money into existence through land, labor, and capital, what if we were to improve uh, the way, what we measure? And maybe we can, we can create a new value that way. So the GDP, as we know, it includes things like you know, the babysitter, um, the products and services that we make, uh, the production in general, government purchases, land development. So you know that, that old model, land, labor, and capital. But GDP does not measure things like motherhood, uh, kindness and empathy. How can, you, how can you run a business without kindness and empathy? You, you just can't do it. Um, innovation, sustainability, charity among each other, the way we treat each other on the roads and, 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 the, and when we're walking down the street, and, and self-preparation. So if I was to make the sandwich, it doesn't go to GDP. But if I buy the sandwich at a restaurant, it does go to GDP, even if I don't eat it. So it just kind of shows how arbitrary our system is for measuring money into existence. Um, and we're broke, so what do we do? Well, let's, we can measure money differently or measure value differently. And, and this is the thing that, that really gets me and uh, the people really excited about blockchain. But there's a few, a few things we have to understand about, about that. Um, if you look at the value of engineering, for example, you know, like a fireman has very little value until there's a fire. Um, and then you measure the value of the fireman in terms of the size of the fire. So you have to have a fire in order to measure the fireman. Um, without the fire, you know, the, the fireman doesn't do much. They're not very valuable. So what if you had an engineer that, that, that um, built a structure which never caught on fire? Well, the, the value of the engineer would be invisible. You, you would have no idea what the value of that engineer is because there was never a fire. And, and this is really silly. It's ridiculous. But this is the way, this is a lot of value which isn't being measured. That's how I see it. Um, and if that measure, if that value could be measured, then it could be turned into a form of, of productivity that can now be traded among people. So um, you, you look at um, 
How, how do you do that? Well, what do, what do engineers do? Engineers reduce risk from systems. So they reduce the risk of, say, um, an airplane uh, crashing. Um, you would not get into an airplane which was not somehow designed by an engineer. Um, they, they reduce the risk that um, the bridge is going to collapse. So they reduce the risk that the Internet's going to go out or that the fire is going to happen. So risk is a really easy thing to measure. I mean, it is. I mean, there's a, there's, it's a little bit technical, but it's something that's done by banks and insurance companies all the time. Um, insurance companies, they, they measure risk and they build these products around them. And uh, in banks, they, they, have, they, they know what's risky. They know who's a risky bet and who's not. So it's not an impossible thing to do. It's just something that's not being done. So what if you were to measure the risk um, that engineers take out of the, of, of the system? Well, what you have now is this virtuous circle. Um, a bank will not lend money um, to a project uh, that's not insured. An insurance company will not lend money to a project which is not properly engineered. And you can't properly engineer a project unless um, you have good financing because you, know, you, have to, you, know, th you have to pay the engineers while they're doing the design long before the object is generating revenue. So you have this virtuous circle. And this became very apparent to me when I was in, in Mexico working on NAFTA. When I was down there, I looked at Mexico, I'm like, oh my gosh, this place is, this is back in 1992, 93. This place is really backwards. I mean, this is, the infrastructure is terrible. The engineers must be really bad. So I took a job at the engineering school to, uh, to, to um, you know, to, I took a job as a teacher at the school, at an engineering school. And I, I figured that, the, you know, the engineers were really smart when I was talking to them. These guys were really smart, extremely creative. So I decided to test them against the known standard. So I sent them to the American board exams, and they did extremely well. So I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a big disconnect here. I mean, how can there be such a backwards country, but these engineers are equally as good as American engineers? As it turned out, the insurance count industry was, um, was incomplete. So there was holes in the insurance. So if you couldn't insure the road which connected two cities, then those two cities would not have commerce. So the, so the economy, so it wasn't a matter of being able to build a road, it was a matter of providing insurance to that road because then you can get the finance and then you can get the engineering. So this was what NAFTA was all about, providing um, services and in, in insurance and finance and engineering. Um, I'm not going to talk much more about that, only that at that period of time, um, you were able to see this virtuous circle extremely clearly. And, and this was an observation that we made back then. So we've always kept it in our mind, and um, so we've come up with another, um, uh, it's called production function. So instead of land measuring value in terms of land, labor, and capital, we can measure value in terms of insurance risk, finance risk, and engineering risk. Okay, so risk is risk. It's the same risk that everybody uses. So you have now one thing that you can measure with blockchain that is common to banks, finance, and engineering, so that now you can you can build the things that society needs with this with a, a completely bypass land, labor, and capital. So I mean, we look at our world now, and all the corruption is about you know who can grab all the land, who can control all the labor, who can own all the capital. So all all this a lot of the problems in the segmentation of industries. Um, and segmentation of politics and polarization of ideas are all based on this rush, this battle, this, this, this thing for land, labor, and capital. If we were to completely bypass that whole trip and go to a different system, which is reducing systemic risk, then you would have a completely different set of priorities in business and commerce and society and so forth. So that's like the big vision um, that we have, and it's really, it's really easy to do. And this is what we're building a, a blockchain um, uh, to do this sort of thing. Um, and it's pretty simple to do. It's, it, what you do is an engineer makes a claim, then another engineer validates that claim, that claim goes on the blockchain, and then that's called a unit transaction. And if you take all these unit transactions and you pile them up on top of each other, they're on a blockchain so you can tell when they happened with respect to time. So a blockchain is like a moving background, and you sort of stick your sticky note on the, on the moving background, and then you analyze them computationally later. So this gives us the ability to, um, to create these new ideas that that the, the Eli Whitney's did. It gives us the same effect as an idea that the Copernicus had or and um, and changes everything. So now we you know that's that's what 
we're looking at for blockchain. So the problem we have today is we have a $237 trillion um, deficit, which means this is global. I'm not picking on the United States. This is pretty much the world owes itself three times more money than what exists. Okay, so um, I wish I didn't know math. I wish I was enumerate. I wish I didn't know what that meant. But you owe more than what exists. Something's got to give, okay? And we've, we've seen in the past that there's going to be a, a, a social adjustment, which is probably going to be very unfortunate. I mean, I saw a massive devaluation in Mexico, and it was just horrific. And we're seeing these things happen now in Venezuela, and we saw it in Germany, so we're, it's in, in Argentina. Uh, we, we know what these things are like, and they're never, never fun. So how are we going to survive this adjustment without the calamity which is going to ensue. We actually have to build a parallel economic system next to the existing economic system which hedges it. So as one starts to decline, the other one starts to take over. We're not talking about a big, massive, um, you know, stick it to the man, we're going to redistribute wealth and all that stuff. We're talking about how do you build a practical system which can hedge the system which is declining. So as one goes down, the other one goes up. Um, this is what we're talking about by storing value in infrastructure. Instead of storing value in gold, instead of storing value in, in debt, we store value in infrastructure, and that's the stuff that everybody needs anyway, and that's going to help them produce anyway. So this, this is what we're trying to do. What does that mean for you guys? Okay, it's um, the place where we have to be is right here in the middle of the digital world and the physical world because the computer computation the compute computer era is, is making these digital twins of everything digital twins of buildings digital twins of of, um, of climates of cities iot is, is part of that ai is part of that all these technologies kind of fall under that bucket of digital twin but what if that digital twin is not correct if you don't calibrate your ai you're going to get bad predictions. So you have to say, okay, here's my group of experts which calibrates my AI. Well, how do you know they're experts? Who validated those experts? You know, how do you know this IoT device is, is reading the right thing? How do you maintain it? How do you know it's not being corrupted by another, uh, another force acting on it that nobody knows about? So the era where the society needs to be is in this era of the physical sibling of the digital twin. So the big application that we see for societies to become, um, instead of we shift our role from brokers to adjudicators. So each one of you are now a specialist in some era, area, and you're registered on, on a blockchain as a specialist on that area, and you would show up to a site and verify, yes, this is the truth. And then that is, your, your credentials are established on the blockchain, so the blockchain can now trust you, and you now adjudicate that contract, and you can have the flow of, of money continue from there. So that is the big, um, the big job ahead of us. And the only way to do that is to collaborate with each other. Um, there's a lot of blockchains out there saying, I mean, I'm, I'm working with a big giant company, and uh, they, if you're not on a hyperledger, then they don't want to talk to you. And, and that's kind of uh, disturbing because, you know, in order to get out of this mess, we all have to be talking to each other. It doesn't matter, you know, you know everybody wants to be the replacement currency. When the dollar collapses, they want to be the black market currency. And, and, and that's just not the way to think about this, okay? The way to think about this is as the dollar is slowly diminishing, we are slowly replacing it with something else. Um, so that we can just, you know, get to the next economy without, you know, bad things happening. So that's the big message I want to bring. This is why we collaborate with, with Randall. Randall, we found him in the global, um, what was it, the, the Government Blockchain Association. We're the engineering uh, co um, consortium, and we've done everything we possibly can to, to coordinate with groups such as the Chamber of Commerce, with the um, government um, blockchain people, with the construction blockchain people, with the finance blockchain people, because we all we're all in this together, and and we have we can't just neglect the social component of this thing. Remember, it came from social component. The blockchain is just a, a clumsy dance that a computer needs to do in order to simulate the human piece. Well, we can't just forego the human piece. We have to strengthen that human piece more now than ever. So this is the big message. 
uh, we want to bring forward. Um, this is a little bit technical about what we do. I'm going to skip this in case you have any questions. Um, so how do we know all this? Well, the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium, well, I started many years ago. Um, I told you about the communes. I told them about that sort of stuff. We also got into a NAFTA. We are, we are the ones who, are, who, are, who built that model um, of NAFTA, the, the, the virtuous circle. Um, in Boeing, we worked for um, uh, knowledge assets. They had this generation gap between uh, young people and old people, nothing in between. So we had to build a knowledge transfer system, which got both those sides um, communicating with each other. And it was less about engineering than it was about social. It was about getting them to socialize, and then you got the knowledge transfer. It wasn't about getting engineering, showing, you know, giving me engineering, you give me engineering. It's all about social, and you, know, you cannot avoid that. Social Flights was um, another project we started. It was like the Uber for private jets. And that turned into a, um, that was very interesting because it taught us that there's no discrete solution, no one single solution, but there's a probability that a jet will fill. There's a certain probability that you can get uh, this business plan to close. If you start relying on probabilities instead of trying to solve the problem definitively, then you can get a lot more done. So this is what that taught us. And now um, the Ingenesis project was getting involved with a lot of those, the social currency movement and so forth. And then blockchain hit, and we ran um, the FinTech task force. We wrote the, we wrote the actual the position paper for the National Society of Professional Engineers. Um, we won the contest, uh, the insurance commissioners, we, had, we consulted to them. We formed this consortium, and we partnered with um, Blockhouse in Switzerland. And, um, and now we've just actually released, we, we, we've, we've built a blockchain which is our own native blockchain, which performs that simple task that I described earlier. And that's, um, that's in test right now. So we think it's a very, a lot, a majority of the problems in the world we think are very, very simple to solve. Um, but it's going to take uh, people, it's going to take the community all to reach a social consensus. Don't rely on the computer consensus. It's all going to be about social consensus. Um, now, if you want, I'm not sure how we are on time. I could, I could take questions from here. I can deep dive into any subject you want. These are some of the people we've been consulting, advising. Here's our disclaimer. Um, you're talking about us? Okay, yes. We're, we've developed a very simple blockchain. We do not believe that we need to have this enormous um, ecosystem just yet. So we have a simple blockchain, and what it does is it, is it measures this value into existence. That's all it does. And once you've measured it into existence, you can now assign a currency to it. And it's, the currency represents value stored in infrastructure or, or, the, or the decisions of engineers. And community, we're hoping that society would say, yes, I need to be warm, and gold does not keep me warm, but this engineering um, created the heater and the energy, and therefore it's the value that I'm willing to trade. Um, so the question was, what blockchain did we model? Um, as you know, everything is pretty much a clone of everything else. You know, BitShare, Bitcoin was a clone of, of, of um, Hashcash. Ethereum was started out as a clone of, of Bitcoin. What we did is we cloned, we cloned Steemit, and that's a, a delegated proof of stake. Um, so it's not a proof of work, it's a proof of stake. And it's much more efficient, and it has a very high throughput, and it has a very high reliability, and um, it's been proven. So Steemit is a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a curation um, software, it's a curation application, and it quickly reached a valuation, a very high valuation. Uh, in a short period of time. It's, it's since settled since then, but it, it demonstrated the concept that people are willing to provide content and then people upvote that content and then the value of that curation it can be articulated in a token. We're changing a lot of things to Steam it. We're issuing two currencies. One is called mass. The other one is called gravity. The mass is, you get, um, is the thing that you can trade on exchange, but the gravity is the thing which represents your reputation. So when now I make a claim with high gravity creates more mass. So these two tokens interact with each other in very interesting ways. And we've actually built a game out of it. So we use something, it's the mathematics is called, it's a multi-agent algorithmic game. 
So the way these two tokens interact with each other is what discerns the value of, of the, inter, of, of the um, claim and the validation. It's a little bit heady, but don't worry, it's simple to use, but the actual game and the mechanics and the analysis, um, they're, they're, there's a lot of mathematics and it's, it's, it's proven mathematics, so you know, it's not something we're just making up, so we're basing it on the research of Nobel laureates the, and so forth, so um, hopefully, hopefully it works. So what happens is um, somebody make, an engineer makes a claim and then another engineer has to validate that claim. So if the engineer makes a claim and nobody validates it, that's like fake news. Okay, they made a claim, nobody wants to validate it, you know, they're not registering anywhere. But if you do get a claim and you do get a validation, the claimant gets mass and the validator gets gravity. So now the only, so that goes on to a database. So now there's a, um, that claim now becomes part of the engineering body of knowledge. So the claim may be for how to construct a bridge or how to install these pipes or how to, um, to build this air conditioning unit, how to balance these, these heat exchangers. So these are all claims that are made. Now, if somebody wants, like a bank or an insurance company, wants to access that data in order to reduce the risk in a project, they have to buy those tokens. And the only people who have those tokens are the engineers. We don't hold tokens. We just give them all away. So that creates a market between the engineers and the banks and the insurance companies. And that's what increases the value of the mass. As the mass goes up in value, more people start putting in content and more validators come on to validate. And that starts getting these tokens to move and to change hands and to be divided by each other, to be multiplied by each other, to be used in, in equations and for analysis and so forth. So that's, that's how it plays out. There's that market that goes to the banks and the insurance company because they want to reduce risk. So they need to know what the engineering is required to keep, say, the roof from caving in or, you know, or, or, or to inspect buildings after an earthquake or a hurricane. They're going to need to get all this knowledge so they would go buy these mass tokens to acquire it. You know, a thousand years ago, there weren't engineering schools. Um, the, the, you know, the university system is something that we created, and they call them engineers now. But, you know, a thousand years ago, they were makers of useful things. So the carpenter and the, uh, and the, and the, and the, and the blacksmith, and, um, you know, th those were the engineers of their day. Um, people who made useful things. So we're, we're hoping that eventually the definition of an engineer starts to change so that anybody who's making a useful thing can make a useful claim that would be validated by another person who makes useful things. So that's where we're going to start getting the generalized reciprocity. But we start with engineers because they've got the direct link to banks and insurance companies. But all of us have a link to, to banks and insurance companies. The way you drive a car so that you're not crashing in everybody and you're not blowing things up, you're participating in that whole act of reducing systemic risk by your generalized behaviors. So we're hoping that this idea generalizes to include everybody. So now it's in everybody's best interest to reduce risk rather than create risk. You see, you see how that's going to play out? It's, it, well, nobody, people don't know what their mortgage is made out of, but they get mortgages all the time. They really do. People don't know. Uh, they don't need the education to know how Google selects your... You just use the application. So that will be kind of what we're banking on, that the user interface will be so simple and so intuitive that you don't worry about, um, you know, where, where the money's coming from. It's just that you do productive things and, and you get paid, and that's the way it should be um, by the system. So uh, the education, yes, it's going to be, edu you know, you do have to have some education, um, but it's not rocket science. Well, I think, I think what's important, so the question is, um, knowledge goes bad, knowledge becomes obsolete, you know? Um, knowledge is bad, we make really bad assumptions. Um, but what's important about that is that we have a forensic record of it. So if I make a really bad decision and everybody follows me down this really bad rabbit hole and things go really bad, at least we've got 
a record, we can go back to the source. It's like a disease. You can go back to where was the first, who's ground zero? Who's the first person who have it? Now you can track where that bad idea got propagated and you can go off and correct it now. Then, you can't do that today. You know, you get a bad idea um, and it just, it stays there. It's, it's like, and you can't correct it because you don't know where it is. You have no visibility of it. So, um, so if you do make a mistake, you can always, you can write a contract which negates the mistake. You can make a claim that I made that wrong claim, have that validated and reverse it. So that's not a problem on the blockchain. But what's most important is, is that time function. You've got, you've got the bad information recorded on the blockchain. You can go back and find it when it happened, where it happened, and you can find all the events after that because you've got the time function, and you can forget about all the events before that because they're irrelevant. And, and that's how you combat bad ideas is knowing where they started. You know what's interesting is our problem is mostly internal. It's the engineering profession which has been incredibly slow to adopt blockchain. You saw the third slide I showed there was almost no investment in eng tech. And our biggest problem is the engineering firms are not adopting change. Uh, and it's probably a good idea because, you know, an airplane, you don't want to change anything on an airplane because the last one worked just fine. You don't want to change anything because the next one might, you might, you know, crash the airplane. So I could fully understand the conservative nature of engineering firms, but that is our biggest uh, hurdle right now is getting them to, um, to, to adopt this or to work with this. Another problem is that engineers are, um, they're the golden goose. And the last thing you want to do is decentralize engineering because now your engineers are going to go talking to each other and they're going to start exchanging information and, and then they're going to go work for other people and it's going to be a big problem. Um, so they're very protective of their engineers. But it's precisely getting the engineers to talk to each other which is going to create this value. I mean, you have to get the engineers to talk to people. you got to get people to talk to people. Um, in general. So it, it, it's sort of like it's in the best interest to keep people poor, weak, and disorganized because they don't rise up and demand new things. Okay, so there's that overriding principle, you know, kind of keep the people down so they don't rise up and, and, and make change. So we, we might be seeing a little bit of that, but um, I think a few use cases in engineering are particularly powerful. For example, Flint, Michigan. Um, that, that event it goes around the globe, or the collapse of a bridge, it goes around the globe, um, or crash of an airplane. So engineering is very powerful already in that nature. So the idea, is, if we were to get a success, a use case out there that everybody can see, touch, and feel, then, um, then we think the idea will propagate faster. Um, unfortunately, our... our um, our constraint is ourselves. The engineers just have a hard time organizing. I, 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 that probably wasn't the answer you're hoping for, but it's the answer that I got. I, I can give to that. Um, myself, yeah. The the focus that I want to really drive home is what you guys are doing is exactly what needs to be done. Um, forming and getting together in person, live looking each other in the eye, shaking each other's hand, and that's, that's where the value of blockchain is. It's not in the blockchain. It's not in the currency. It's right in front of you. So, I mean, I don't know how, uh, if I was able to get that point across, but the collaboration among people is, um, I got this phone call. People coming in. The collaboration of people is what's really, really important. Oh no, I'm shutting him off. This is important. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Give Give me a call if you have any questions or you want to do deals. We'll come up with something clever. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. All right. Thank you.